Thanks very much for the nice introduction. Uh, I know it's the last talk of the day. Actually, for me, it's the, I just woke up. It's uh, nine hours time difference. So it's uh, the first activity today. This is still my morning coffee. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it light because it's, it's you know, what is it, five, five? Yeah, it's late, right? So I'll keep it light, I'll keep it relaxed. And it's easy because the topic's light, the topic's relaxed, the topic is fun. And that's how I got into it in the first place. Now, of course, uh, uh, it would be very, very nice to be in Munich. It would be very nice to be in Munich. I like Munich a lot. I have an aunt who lives in Munich. Uh, I like the Weisswurst. But if you're like me, uh, nine hours away time difference and many thousands of miles, and you long for Munich, it turns out there is a way out. And that way out is uh, Leavenworth, Washington. So Leavenworth, Washington is a small town of maybe 2,000 people that decided in the 60s that they would become a Bavarian town uh, for the means of tourism. And I actually went there 10 days ago knowing I could not be able to come to Munich. And I took some pictures for you. Uh, and it's full, okay? It actually it works amazingly. This place is crowded. <laughs> uh, and there's some very nice, I mean, it looks, the streets are too wide for Bavaria, right? It's still, it's still American layout, but, um, no, it's not too bad. Uh, this is the place where I had lunch. They actually served goulash, and it's run by a family. Uh, so the grandfather came from Bavaria to serve Bavarian cuisine, and now it's in the third generation. And there's a lot of Bavaria flags everywhere. Okay, uh, so that's my, my relaxed introduction. So what's the topic? The topic is to talk about a certain way of approximately solving linear systems of equations. Um, and if you think about it in terms of applications or what would be useful, this is actually stochastic gradient descent applied to least squares. So stochastic gradient descent is, of course, very popular. Many people are using it. The theory is sort of half developed, I would say. Um, and the big point here is uh, this is an example of stochastic gradient descent that is non-trivial, has highly non-trivial dynamics, but can be analyzed rigorously. So it's, it's, it's a way of solving the systems of equations. But it's also a toy model for stochastic gradient descent, and it leads to very beautiful pure math problems on the side. It's sort of really quite nice. I found it surprisingly rich mathematically. It's a simple idea, but it leads to very cool, interesting problems. And I will mention some of these problems explicitly. And most of these problems, you know, I don't know how hard they are. I know I can't do them, but that means very little. And I think very few people have thought about them. So that's possibly, you know, some motivation. So I'll always talk about square matrices. Uh, everything I talk about has sort of an extension to uh, rectangular overdetermined systems. Uh, I don't want to talk about this. I'll keep it simple. And by matrix, invertible, unique solution. And I'll use AI, which may be a bit non-standard to denote the i row of the matrix. So we will only be looking at rows of the matrix, not at columns. So AI is you know, the i row. So in particular, you can write the system as follows, right? If you were to abbreviate, you can write the system like this. Or equivalently, and that's the way I like to think about it as, as you know, and in a product equations that have to be satisfied simultaneously. Okay, that's it, right? So what this means is it's actually geometrically very simple, right? You have hyperplanes and the intersect. And I think we sort of, we learn this in high school, but then we never think about it in university, right? Because the moment you sort of go to university, you're like, oh, you know, systems and bases and spans and kernels. But this is, this is actually sort of what it is. And once you think about it that way, there's a nice way of solving it or approximately solving it. And that was introduced by Kaczmarz. Um, so he's a Polish mathematician, got a PhD in 1924 for functional equations, which is, you know, it doesn't exist anymore, really. <laughs> It's one of these things. He spent some time with, with Hardy and, and Paley. Um, and then in 1937, he wrote this paper, which is very short, and it's called Approximate Solutions of Linear Equations. And this was before compu computers. This was before big data. So I think it maybe had limited impact. Uh, but he's coming back with a revenge, so to say. Um, so I tried to find out who that person was just a little bit more. And here's what I found in the Mac Tudor online math biography webpage. I, I mean, it's sort of, 
you know, when I die and someone asks you, what was he like? You know, don't say that. Make something up. Say I loved carrots, some crazy, I mean, come on. This is sort of, you shouldn't say this, right? I mean, like, I don't know. The fact that this is even online is sort of, I don't know. Well, okay, I guess history. Right? So it turns out he died and it's not clear where and it's not clear when, and that's all the horrors of World War II. So that's, it's not even clear which year. Uh, this was two years after the, after the paper. So I'll tell you about the method. The method is gorgeous. And when you think about it in terms of hyperplanes, it makes sense, right? It's uh, very natural. You want this. We don't have it, right? We have some sort of starting point. We have some guess or some non-guess what the solution is. So what we can do is we can just start with a random vector, some random guess for what the solution could be. You know, take the zero vector if you want. And then you just project onto a hyperplane. And then you project onto another hyperplane. And then you project onto another hyperplane. That's it. And well, well, yeah, projecting onto hyperplanes is very easy. That, that we also learn how to do. And uh, in particular, if you look at the picture very carefully, you see there's a Pythagorean theorem in every step. Every time you do a, a hyperplane projection, the distance to the true solution decreases. Because you know this squared plus this squared is this squared. So the distance is always going down. Or it stays the same if you're already on the hyperplane that you're projecting to, right? If you then you, nothing changes, but otherwise the distance always goes down. Uh, and in particular, it's also very nice to write down the formula for what happens if I project onto a hyperplane. Then you know, this is the oh, the magnetic sphere plus here. I say it's very simple, but uh, I mess it up every time. Minus or plus, whatever one's correct. Main point is the following. Uh, it's an inner product. So the only thing you do when computing the next iterate is you compute one inner product with one row of the matrix, the row that corresponds to the hyperplane. So this is cheap. And this is why people like doing it because if you have a million by million matrix, it's got 10 to the 12 entries, you can't load it into memory. <laughs> Maybe you can now, I don't know. I'm not up to date on this, but uh, okay. Make it 10 to the eight by 10 to the eight matrix. You can't load it into memory. So, but this you can do, right? Because you don't have to load a single row into memory. So it's very, very cheap. Uh, it's very fast to do an iterate. And that's why it's useful for large matrices. So uh, what's originally been proposed is, okay, so the question is how do you pick the hyperplanes? And what's been originally proposed is you just, you know, you just go through them in order, right? You see the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. You do this until you've done all of them once. And then you go back to the beginning and say, now I'm projecting back to the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. And that one's a bit difficult to analyze. So I don't think there's a complete analysis. Um, it's also, it also it, what well, unfortunate is, uh, it depends a bit on how you order the hyperplanes. And it's also not clear how you want to order them. And that's maybe an open problem I should have written on the slides. It's not quite clear how to do this actually. Um, in particular, if you look at the original paper, uh, Kachma says that, uh, of course, the convergence of the method is geometrically obvious because the distance to the intersection is, is, is decreasing. Uh, but the convergence rate is not at all obvious. And in particular, for the standard ordered method, it will depend on the ordering of the hyperplanes, and it's not so clear how to do it. And what was then proposed is a random method. And the idea is you just pick a random hyperplane at each point. You randomize the entire method. You still sort of go through them randomly, but um, maybe it gets easier. And it turns out it does behave a little bit better. Um, and it's been actually used since the 1980s. So this method has been sort of fairly popular. I, I will say that probably if you know how to order the hyperplanes correctly, the deterministic method might be faster than the random method. But the question is, how do you order them correctly? What's the correct ordering of the hyperplanes? And I don't think anyone knows. And maybe if this problem could be solved, then you know people wouldn't be talking about the random method, but we don't know how to do that. So now we talk about the random method. And the random method was then, so this was pointed out much later, the random method can actually be interpreted as stochastic gradient descent for a standard least squares problem. So it's a very cool method. It's very nice. It's funky. It's uh, it's fast to get iterates. It's fun. It's very easy to implement. It's fun to experiment with. And simultaneously, it's a wonderful toy model for 
the complexities of stochastic gradient descent, right? One of the phenomena you observe in gradient descent, you observe flattening off of the curve, things like this. Like, where's it coming from? This, this is a, a, a toy model with, that can be studied. So um, there has been some sort of renaissance in the field uh, that starts with the paper of Stroma and Vershinen. And what they say is, you know, if you pick the ith equation with a likelihood that's proportional to the norm of that row, then you can prove a beautiful estimate. And the estimate says that the error that you have in the kth iterate step in L2 squared decreases exponentially, this is a factor less than one from the original error. And okay, so this here, F is the Frobenius norm. And sigma n is uh, the smallest singular value of A, which is uh, positive because the matrix is in blue. Which is sort of uh, fun because, uh, you know, you hit exponential convergence. The downside is, of course, uh, this quantity is often very, very close to one. So it's less than one and you get exponential convergence, but, you know, 0 0.999 to the kth power decays quite slowly. And the question is how to speed this up. Um, maybe we should stop for questions. No, we're good. So uh, Strom and Vashinen's paper is gorgeous. Okay, it's absolutely gorgeous. You should have a look. It's really fantastic. And I think the paper is so nice that that's one of the reasons why people were inspired. And the proof is very simple. Like not introducing notation, this is the proof. Okay, it's a full line proof. Okay, then you have more lines of explaining what those four lines are, but it's a four line proof. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and it's really fun. And so have a look at that paper. It's very nice. It's a very well written paper. And I got I got interested in this thing just because uh, it's so pretty. It's so it's so fun, right? You jump from one hyperplane to the next. What happens? I mean, how can you resist? Um, and here's what I wanted to do originally. So this was the original plan that I had. I wanted to sort of understand what happens to this error vector x k minus x, right? Because you see in the picture here, you'd expect this to sort of randomly move around, right? On the, like, it's a vector, it points in the direction. And I sort of expected this to be random, right? But then I ran five examples on a computer and it didn't seem random at all. In fact, what I saw is that if I normalize these vectors to be on the, on the unit sphere, then these vectors tend to, essentially they are mainly linear combinations of singular vectors corresponding to small singular values. That's what I observed. So this was not, I mean, I expected it to be random because you literally jump from one random hyperplane to the next, right? <laughs> like this by, by default, by construction, there's no structure in the, in the algorithm, right? The way you pick the hyperplanes, except weighted by the size of the, the norm, but uh, make all the rows have the same norm, right? Divide by their size, make them all norm one. It's completely random. Why would this be not random? So it turns out um, there's actually a theorem you can prove and the theorem is very, very interesting. Um, it says essentially the following. It says, uh, I'll just write it out. It says there is a, a refined identity, not an inequality. There is an identity. And the identity says that the error that you make, if you express it in the right basis, and the right basis are the right singular vectors of the matrix, then there is an equation for how quickly they decay. And it's actually the same kind of equation that Strom and Vashinen had, except they had sigma n, which is the smallest one, which leads to the smallest decay. But that, and that's actually true, which follows from this identity, for the smallest singular vector. So what you have is you have that, you know, you, you start with an initial guess x0, you look at the error x0 minus x, and you expand it in the singular vectors. And the ones that correspond to small singular values, they're gonna stay around for a long time. They're gonna stick with you. The ones corresponding to large singular values, those are gonna decay quite quickly. And that's why what's left is actually a combination of, mainly a combination of low frequency singular values, or small singular values. So vectors correspond to small singular values. And this is a whole bunch of implications. In particular, you have sort of different rates of contractions and subspaces. And it's the right one, because what, it, what, it, what happens here is that the large singular vectors, the ones that really describe what the matrix does, those are being controlled quite effectively. Which means very quickly, 
you know, xk is not necessarily going to be close to x. But a of xk is going to be fairly close to b. Because the large singular vectors have been captured effectively. Small ones not. So it's very funny in the sense that if you if you want, you know, if you're interested in the exact numerical solution, that's one thing. If you're interested approximately in a vector such that a of x is roughly b, this method does exactly the right thing. And it's quite fast. Slowest rate of decay, if you look at this, the slowest rate of decay, well, this number is closest to one if sigma l is sigma n, the largest, sorry, the smallest singular vector. And that gives you exactly the stroma Verschinen bound. And in particular tells you that this can't be improved. So the Stroma Verschinen is in general sharp up to. Sort of, basically, if you start with a singular vector corresponding to the smallest singular value, you expect exactly Stroma Verschinen decay. So here's one problem. I'm giving you a beautiful identity for expectation. Very simple, very clean. What about the variance? I, What's actually happening? I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'll take anything at this point, right? I mean, expectation tells me about the expectation. It doesn't tell me about the deviation from the expectation. So what kind of result can be proven that says, you know, you're sort of close to the expectation with high likelihood or you're far away? I don't know. I think this is, uh, I just don't know how to do it. Um, but I think it's a very interesting open problem. In particular, here's a fun fact. You can actually use this follows from this method. You can use this method to find the smallest singular vector of a matrix. <laughs> and you do this follows. You just solve the problem A of X is zero. Well, if A of X is zero, then you know what the solution is. The solution is zero. And what you do is you start with a non-zero iterate. Then XK minus X is always XK, right? XK minus X is always XK. <laughs> And then it converges to very quickly a combination of small singular vectors. So here's an example that I did. I picked some random matrix, I think 100 by 100 or something. And I'm plotting you, uh, I picked the right hand side to be zero, I know the solution to be zero. And then when I'm plotting this really quotient, you see it actually decays quite dramatically very quickly. And then you see there's certain chumps where you project onto the right hyperplane and you lose a lot. That was sort of fun. I, I'm not claiming it's an effective method of finding small singular vectors, but uh, it's probably an effective method to find approximations of, to get close to the subspace of small singular vectors. Okay, so second fact. So this, now you start wondering, right? Why, why, why is there a convergence to sort of a deterministic subspace since it's a random method? And the problem is roughly the following. So assume you have sort of you know two vectors given by these two lines here, then what happens is you sort of what you want to do is you want to bounce in here, but you're not really bouncing between those, you're bouncing on the other side. So you get sort of stuck. You get trapped in narrow regions between hyperplanes. That's sort of the issue. Like if you look at the hyperplanes that describe whose intersection describes the solution, then there are certain tiny narrow arrows uh, regions and somehow the method finds those and those also geometrically correspond to small singular vectors and small singular values. So you wanna escape that region. The question is, how do you do it? How do you find a proper, for example, a proper sequence of hyperplanes to project to uh, that would help you escape? And I tried to quantify this a little bit uh, because I like it because it's a random process and somehow it's not random at all. <laughs> And here's how I tried to quantify this. Um, what I thought is I'll, I'll take the error from two consecutive iterates and I normalize them. So I get two points on the unit sphere or two vectors on the unit sphere. And the question I ask myself is, is how, how large is the inner product, which tells me about the angle between those. So what's the angle between two consecutive error iterates? And so there's a technical assumption that you shouldn't divide by zero. And then turns out there's again an identity. And the identity is very, very interesting because it says essentially the following. It says, if you're in a region of space, so if x k minus x normalized, if this is mainly large singular vectors, then if I apply the matrix A to it, I get a very large vector. And this number here is small, which means the consecutive error iterates move a lot on the unit sphere. They very quickly move around. Conversely, once you're in, uh, close to subspaces described by small singular vectors, this number is gonna be very close to one. 
which means you don't really move anymore. You sort of get stuck. So it's a, it's a way of measuring sort of the geometric distribution of these these iterates. And um, in particular, once you once you're in a bad region, the region comprised of small singular values, small singular vectors, uh, it's hard to get out. Now you could say I'm rediscovering the wheel. I'm rediscovering that small singular values are very bad for solving linear systems of equations. <laughs> I agree. That's maybe not a new insight, but uh, what we have here is a geometric approach to it that might lead to different perspectives and there might be different ideas and there's always the advantage of being able to deal with large matrices that's one one of the motivations the other motivation is just it's cool geometry again same problem what about the variance i have no idea i don't know how to do variance or third moment or 1.7th moment i'll take any moment or you know anything at all you, 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 large deviation estimates i mean anything and second problem is how do you escape the narrow region? And as I don't know, I'd like to know. I think this is where you can make further improvements. Okay, so uh, you should have a proof. So there's a, I think a, a lemma by Littlewood, which says every identity is the proof because it says the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. And this is certainly true here, so this is the proof. There's equal signs all the way. Okay, so how did I find this? Well, I'm not showing you the 50 identities that didn't work out, right? I tried all sorts of different expressions and I tried to see whether there's any structure that pops up, there's anything interesting, and that's the one that ended up working out. I would very much like to have more such identities. I would like to understand the process by capturing, you know, products, other things, and it's not so clear what to try. Okay. Now let's talk about some other ideas. So what I've been telling you about so far is stroma vershinin's approach. So you weigh the hyperplanes, you pick them with a likelihood that's proportional to their norm, the norm of the row of the matrix. But maybe you shouldn't pick the likelihoods randomly, right? Because if you think about it, right, you have an, an approximate solution and then you say, well, if you have an approximate solution, maybe you should check which of the n equations is violated a lot which means you should check which hyperplane is very far away from you because then if you project on, on that one you certainly lose a lot in the norm maybe you should do it randomly and uh, this is actually known so picking the the, the hyperplane that's furthest away is known as the maximum residual method and it's been known empirically that it's faster for, for quite a while um and I thought about it for a while, and the problem that I had with maximum residual, which in hindsight was not really a problem, but uh, is that it's deterministic, right? It's not random at all. You always pick the one that's furthest away. So it seemed to me like it would be very difficult to analyze this because it's not random. And here's the substitute. I, I was interested in what happens if I choose the ith equation, the ith hyperplane, with a likelihood that's proportional to the pth power of the error that it currently undergoes. And then you divide by, of course, all the p powers to get a probability. And if, if p is zero, then this sort of corresponds to a classical method. If p is, is infinity, it corresponds to maximum residual. Um, that sort of nicely interpolates between the two. But if p is very, very large, right? if p is 50, then really the algorithm already behaves like the maximum residual method because you have, you know, you have these vectors. I think you take the 50th power, which strongly emphasizes the largest entry, it makes it very likely for you to just pick the largest entry. And if, if you don't agree with me, you replace 50 by 5 million. So uh, that's sort of, it's, it's a continuous interpolation and there's not a lot of difference. And the method converges in a certain sense to maximum residual in this, in, in this sense. And it turns out um, it actually does a lot better. So here blue is just you pick them all proportional to size of the entries. Orange is piece one, green is piece two, and 20 is piece red. So it gets a lot faster. And it turns out this can be proven. So I was, I was uh, it turns out if you just sit down and you write stuff out, within a page, you arrive at the appropriate result. The result is this. Looks a bit intimidating, 
But it turns out that it's a very nice inequality saying that this is always at least the rate of randomized catch marks. So you're not going to do worse. You can only do, you're going to do as good as Stroma version in this approach. And now the question that I have with this, so this is sort of nice, right? Because you're faster. And in particular, if P is very large, you emulate maximum residual. And the question is, is there any structure in the error for this sort of family of methods? Or maybe just for P equals infinity, which is the most interesting one. Um, do you converge to anything interesting? Because for the, the method I just told you about, stroma Vashinian, you converge to small singular vectors. What happens here? What can be done? And I also want to emphasize that this, it seems like a smarter idea to do this, right? You sort of pick the hyperplane that's furthest away from you. It's sort of a greedy algorithm. However, it's still greedy in one step. Are there any smarter ways? Are there any sort of statistics you should keep tabs on during the evolution of the process and then sort of adapt in a smart way? I don't know. I feel we have not even scratched the surface on this. Um, okay, finally, I want to talk about the random walks on the sphere. And this was a big surprise for me, and it's been confusing me ever since, but it's, it's very beautiful geometry. So what we've been doing until now is we're projecting onto the hyperplane, right? So far, so good. But we could also reflect around the hyperplane, right? In fact, this just means multiplying that vector with a two. Then you you go to the hyperplane and then you go the other direction and then you reflect exactly around it. And uh, now you're gonna tell me, well, that's not a good idea because it doesn't get you any closer to the solution. And it doesn't. Uh, in fact, the distance to the solution stays exactly preserved. It does not change at all. That follows again from the Pythagorean theorem or just geometry or just a picture if you want. Nothing happens. And the formula also stays simple. Uh, there might actually be a plus here. Really, I should check this stuff. I always get confused about the plus and the minus. Uh, you just add a two. Whatever it's, whether it's a plus or a minus, you add a two in front. And that gives you that new procedure. Now that new procedure sounds horrible, right? Because you don't get closer to the solution. Uh, well, not really. It's actually great. So it turns out, here's what you do. You start with a random vector, right? Some arbitrary initial guess for the solution. And if you have no initial guess, just take the zero vector. And then you generate a sequence of vectors in Rn by doing this. And again, you can pick the hyperplanes in any way you like. Okay. Uh, you do this for a while. Now the question is, what does this mean do it for a while? Well, you do it for a while. Uh, sorry, that n is not the same as the space dimension. You do it for a while. And what you end up with is you end up with a set of points in Euclidean space that are all exactly on a sphere around the true solution. You don't know what the true solution is, but you have it surrounded. <laughs> and that's why I call it the magic bubble. You don't know what the solution is, you wanna find the solution, but there's this magic bubble around it and it's very, very cheap to construct points on the bubble. You just have to compute, you know, each, comp each step is, is, is one in a product. Computation, it's the same computation as catch much, right? So you get, you get these points on the bubble. Another question is how do you get the solution from those points? And maybe that's the wrong question. Maybe the right question is, how do you get an approximation of the solution from those points? Because you can iterate the process, right? If I have a way of saying, oh, okay, I got these points on a bubble, my best guess for the solution is inside here. Well, then you take this point and you start again. You construct points on a new bubble and you iterate the procedure. I thought this was very fun because it's so pretty. Um, so let's talk about it. The problem is now, so then, you know, I, went, I, I ran into this, I'm like, wow, this is really fun. Here's a question. How do I reconstruct a good approximation of the center of a sphere from knowing many points on the sphere? That seems like uh, elementary geometry. It seems like, you know, you get Euclid and you see Euclid chapter eight, how to construct the center of a sphere from knowing many points on the sphere. It's not in there. Um, especially the fact that you want an approximation is not in there. Uh, so it's not so clear. But let me tell you what I do now. You could do, so that's in Euclid, you could do an exact reconstruction. 
And it turns out that's not difficult. So suppose you have n plus one points that are all on a sphere in Euclidean space. Then it turns out uh, the following is true. If you take the vector that goes from the point x1 to minus x1 to the antipodal point and call that vector 2r, then the inner product of uh, 2r with xi minus x1 is always a number that you can compute. This is actually the, the Thales theorem, right? We, we learned this in school. I learned this in school. I've never used it ever in my entire life. I mean, maybe implicitly, but certainly not explicitly. But here it is, okay? I mean, this is, I think I learned this when I was 12. And, you know, it's really useful 20 years later. Um, so it turns out this is true. So what this is, it just gives you a new linear system of equations, right? For, for 2R, or R, whatever you want to call this. So you get a new system of equations, and they could try to solve that. And now, you, now, well, sort of, now, now the snake is eating its own tail, right? Because we're doing all of this to solve linear systems of equations to begin with, right? Not, not to end up with new linear systems of equations. But it turns out that might not be true. So I can tell you this, and I'll tell you about this very vaguely. Here's what I tried. I said, you know, suppose I start with a linear system of equations. I'm using this magic bubble approach to generate 50,000 points on the sphere, and I'm picking 500 of those randomly. So suppose I start with a 100 by 100 system. I can generate 50,000 points on the sphere very quickly because it's so fast. I pick 100 of those randomly, 500 of those randomly. I built this new linear system of equations. And now what I can do is I can make it as overdetermined as I like, right? Because I can take as many points on the sphere as I like, and each point gives me an additional linear equation in the linear system of equations. So I can get a 100 n by n system or a 10,000 n by n system, massively overdetermined. And maybe the condition number of the system goes up. So maybe this new system of equations is actually easier to solve. Because if that was the case, right, I could just try to solve my new system, I get the R, and then I just take x1 plus R, and that gives me the center of the sphere. So I get a new system of equations. Now when I have this new system of equations, I could try to do it again. I could say, hey, I got a new system of equations. I'm going to generate a random bubble around it. I'm going to create an even more overdetermined system that's even better behaved. And that's sort of, you could imagine a hierarchy of linear systems that get better and better and better. And then you solve the last one and then you go back down. You just plug in and get the original solution. So I tried this and it sort of seems to work, but it didn't seem to work like a lot better than classical methods, or at least I couldn't figure out like, and I couldn't understand the theory well enough. I can tell you here, but uh, I didn't really understand. Like, I think this is a very fun open problem and that's why it's here. Can you use this, or at least in certain cases, can you use this to upgrade the quality of your linear system of equations? It seems that yes. Okay, you can definitely upgrade the quality of your linear system. I've, I've done this. It's actually very easy to do this. Uh, it's very easy. It's five lines of Mathematica to check this, that it's true. Uh, the question is, is, it, is the scaling of things competitive? Uh, is the scaling of things benign? Or if the scaling's not benign, do you get other benefits from running this method? That, that, that I don't know. Okay, now, now some of you are certainly wondering and saying, you know, I'm, I'm trying to reconstruct the center of, uh, of a sphere from knowing points on the sphere. Why don't you take the average? Well, that's certainly a valid point, right? Um, I want I want I want a one following warning. The points on this magic bubble that we get, they're not uniformly at random or anything like this. They're sort of structured because they come from this reflection process. They're, they're, they're not IID or anything. And so it might be that you have you know, 50 points on the North Pole and then one point in Paris. And you wanna get the center of the earth from those points. You know, not exactly the North Pole, right? So you have enough information of linear independence and everything, but um, questions, what do you do? So one thing, the first thing I tried Sorry, there's a dog playing. The one thing I tried is uh, average, right? To take the average. Because for sure, one thing I can tell you, right? If I take points on a sphere and I take the average, then certainly the average is going to be inside the sphere, which means if I run this process, I'm going to decrease the distance to the solution. So certainly this can't go wrong or anything like this, right? It's 
definition of convexity. So here's the theorem. And I'm very happy about the theorem. Uh, and I'll tell you in a second why I'm happy. <laughs> so suppose we pick again the i hyperplane with the, the stroma Vershinian likelihood, so likely proportional to the norm of the row. And then we get a center and we get a, a, a sequence of, of points on the sphere. If I take the first m and I take an average as my guess of what the center could be, and I compare to the actual center, this decays in m which is what makes me happy. At a certain rate, there's an inequality here. Now it turns out you're gonna say squared M is horrible. I agree squared M is horrible. And I do not propose running this method for M very, very large. I propose running this method for roughly this amount of steps, because if you do this, then this is gonna be a factor one half and you've decreased the distance to your solution by factor one half. And then you just take that average and you start again. You do it again for this number of steps. You take the average, you get closer by a factor of two each time. And it turns out the scaling is exactly the same as Kachmas. Kachmas needs this many iteration steps to decrease the distance to the solution by a factor of two. So it's exactly the same. So it's as fast, it has the same memory requirements, and it has the same computational cost each step. It's more or less comparable. In, in all matter. I, in fact, when you run it on a computer, even bad implementations are like, there's a 10% difference in runtime or something. I mean, it's really quite indistinguishable from Kachmats, but it comes with an additional geometric flavor. And this is for doing the average. And the average is certainly the wrong thing to do, right? Certainly one, you know, we have to be smarter than the average. And there's lots of things you could do. For example, right, you take the average as a first initial guess, and then you take the distance, or you compute the distance uh, between your suspected average, I mean, between the empirical average and the end points. And you know, the once when the, whenever the distance is very large, then it probably means you have undersampled that point and you want to reweight it and put more emphasis on it, right? I mean, think about 50 different points close to the North Pole and Paris. It's not going to be easy to reconstruct the center of the, you know, and add Rome and add Seattle and add Munich. Now what? You got 50 points that are not so good. You get four points that are pretty good. How do you use those four points effectively? And it seems like there should be a very nice geometry that helps you. And, and even, and this is sort of the most important point I want to make here, even, even the average is already pretty good. <laughs> So my question to all of you is, how do I reconstruct a good approximation of the center of the shears from knowing many points on the sphere? And the rules of the game are as follows. You can give me a bad approximation as long as it's fast to compute. The average is a bad approximation, but it's very fast to compute. Or you can give me a good approximation that it takes a long time to compute. And one example would be solving the exact system of equations using the Thales theorem. So that would be far, uh, slow, but it would be extremely accurate. And the question is, can you find anything between those two extremes? Something that's a little bit better than the average, but not as computationally expensive as solving a linear system of equations. Or solving a full, you know, if you want to solve a smaller one, why not, right? So that's the question. Maybe a more concrete question. You're given 100 end points in n dimensions. What's the best guess you can have for the center of the sphere? And then what runtime do you get? That's the computational aspect. And the good news is even the worst possible idea you could have is already as good as random catch marks. In particular, if you come up with a better idea of how to do it, you're beating random catch marks by design, right? You get kind of the worse. The moment you come up with something slightly smarter than the average, you have a faster method. So sort of, you, you can see how it's tempting, right? You can see that, uh, <laughs> and you know, I go online, I, I type in, how do I find the center of the sphere from points on the sphere? The only pages I found were people doing computer graphics, because apparently if you have computer games, if you program computer games, you need to solve this problem a lot. And there's a very fast solution, 3D, apparently, but okay, I'm not in 3D. So, okay, I'll, 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 the proof is actually quite simple of this. I'll, I'll sketch it for a moment, but very quickly, very briefly. Flavor of the proof is, okay, you can do translation variance and you say, okay, suppose the sphere is in zero, what happens then? 
And then you do the usual trick, which is if I don't know what the norm does, I square it, right? And I'm going to do some random rotation, rather sort of random reflection operators. I can write it like this sort of more concisely. And then when you square it out, you realize that uh, the problem that you have is this. You have sort of one initial point and then you reflect this randomly 50 times and then you reflect another 25 times. And the question is what's the inner product? And what happens is what you really care about is you care about this problem, right? You first reflect 50 times and then another 25 times. So the question is really what happens if you have a vector and you reflect 25 times? And it turns out there's a very nice sort of decorrelation lemma that says that these objects are decorrelated. Oops. And these objects are decorrelated and um, you get this sort of decay. Okay. And then it turns out you sum up and things are sort of good. So in summary, Kachwat is cool, it's fun, it's uh, it's geometrically beautiful, but it's also mathematically meaningful. It gives you, and I think this has not been properly appreciated, it converges at a certain rate that may be slow, but it very, very quickly gives you vectors xk such that a of xk minus b is actually small. So if you're interested in solving, you know, in finding a vector that roughly looks like it solves the limits of equations, but you know, you don't, you don't have to find the exact vector. This is an amazing method. Um, you can replace reflections by so there's a lot of open problems, which I, I mentioned some of them, but but how do you do it smarter than what I told you? And I think people haven't experimented enough. I think people have barely tried. And there's a lot of there's a check anti pictures on catch marks, but it's 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 very often not motivated by geometry. I find it's often motivated more by, by sort of classical numerical linear algebra. And I apologize for skipping lots of results that are relevant here. Uh, there's, I mean, Stromer machine has like 500 citations. So you can imagine the scope of the literature at this point. So what you can do is you can replace projection by reflection. This gives you the magic bubble. This gives you a method that is essentially as fast. You don't lose its speed, which is sort of counterintuitive. You don't lose its speed. But you gain in geometry because suddenly your problem is, is nice because these things are all the same distance from the true solution. And I find this an interesting problem in itself. I find it interesting from a Euclidean perspective. I find it interesting from a functional analysis perspective. And I find it interesting from a statistics perspective. What can you do? And you know, I'm, it's not hopeless. I tried, I tried all sorts of things and you know, it's actually fairly easy to improve the average. I just couldn't find a method where I could say anything definite, <laughs> where I could prove something rigorous. Um, so my question for you to take home, to keep you up at night, to torture you for the rest of your life, uh, given points on a sphere, where's the center, right? I don't know. And the encouraging part of the story is you don't have to do a lot. Give me an epsilon improvement of the average, an epsilon improvement. Give me an epsilon squared improvement of the average, right? I'm not asking for much here. Um, and I think, you know, it's a uh, five, right? So, oh, I'm stopping right on time. Not even stopping. Okay, I'm stopping right on time. How about that? Thank you very much.